Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone this morning. We are glad that you are here, part of our worship service together this morning. I think we need to make one other announcement. Uh, not, I'm not trying to take Jay's job by any stretch of the imagination. If my calendar is correct, next weekend, Daylight Saving Time starts. Michelle's shaking her head, so I must be right. Good. <laughs> I won't be wrong. And uh, so we don't want you to be late. So be sure to spring forward an hour next Saturday before you go to bed. And, uh, and then we'll talk about the sleep next week. But anyway, don't forget to do that. Huck Finn wrote, or didn't write, but the in story of Huck Finn, Mark Twain wrote it, but in story of Huck Finn or Huckleberry Finn, Huckleberry talks about the time in which Miss Watson took him into the closet and told him he needed to start praying. And so, as the story goes, he said he started to pray. And just every little bit he would pray, but it just didn't seem to do him any good. And he said one time he prayed, and sure enough, he got a fishing line but he didn't get any hooks to go with it, and so it didn't do him any good. And he goes on in that paragraph, and he talks about how that he couldn't figure out if prayer was so good, why Mr. Jones still had his cough, and why Miss Charlotte down the road still, ha still had her ailments, because they sure prayed, and they still had them. And so it came to his conclusion, or he came to a conclusion, that prayer just didn't do you much good. And that's the way people feel not only about prayer, but feel about faith. It just don't do you much good. And sometimes we begin to wonder, where is God in all of this? And will God really, Steve led the song for me, will God really take care of me? Well, God really, is he there? Is he listening? In Psalm 22, if you have your Bible, you might want to look in Psalm 22. That's where we're getting my thoughts, where I'm getting my thoughts for today. We want to know sometimes when we pray, when we kneel, and we've prayed, and we've prayed, and we've prayed, and we've prayed fervently, and we've prayed honestly, and we've prayed sincerely. We've prayed with all faith, truly believing God and believing that he's going to take care of us, and yet we didn't get what we wanted. Maybe we got an answer, but the answer was no. Or we got an answer, and the answer was, after we looked at it after a period of time, really was wait. Or maybe the answer was, you know, here's something else instead. And we wonder how in the world and why in the world could God do that? And, and where is God? And, and, and why doesn't God take care of my need? And why doesn't God answer my, my prayers? I, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. And you've probably had times in your life where you've done that. You've prayed for a sick parent, a child that was sick, a sick loved one. Or you've prayed for something in your life. Maybe you prayed for a job, and you got a job, but it wasn't the job necessarily that you thought you wanted. And you just wonder, where, where is God in all of this? And where, when God is so silent, where is he, and, and why isn't he doing what I've asked, and, and why isn't he doing what I've instructed him to do? And so this morning in Psalm 22, the psalmist begins, and you have heard these words before, probably in a different context. He begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, some have taken Psalm 22 and have said that Psalm 22 is all about Jesus. It's a psalm of David, and more than likely, it's dual in that it is with regards to David, a time in his life, we don't know when, when he's going through some hardships and some difficulties and he's praying to God and God seemingly isn't answering his prayer the way he wants it to be. Jesus, though, hanging 
on a cross offered up this same sentiment. God, where are you? Why aren't you there? Why are you so silent in a time in which I need you to really talk to me? Well, let me tell you, there are several things in this psalm that spoke and speak to me when I study it. But one of those is that God really does care for me. Matter of fact, in, in verse 24, the psalmist says that God does not despise the affliction of the afflicted. God cares. And he cares for the afflicted. You say sometimes we really wonder why God doesn't pay attention and why he's not paying attention to me. But God does care. James 5 verse 11, James talks about really, we read that, we, we remind, remind, reminded and remember that verse we're talking about the patience of Job. But if you go to the very last part of that verse, it talks about God being gracious and merciful. And in Psalm 86, the psalmist there makes a, a great statement about God there in verse 15, where he talks about how the God is compassionate and graceful, long-suffering, merciful, true. You see, we sometimes, because we don't get what we want, we think, well, God really doesn't care. God, God doesn't care about me, and he doesn't care about my needs. He doesn't care about what's going on in my life. He doesn't care. He doesn't care that I am suffering. He doesn't care that I'm hurting. He doesn't care that I have problems. He doesn't care that I'm afflicted. He doesn't care. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. Bible tells me so. In second, in First Samuel chapter two, this month, the month of March, I'm spending time in my personal devotional time reading and studying the book of First Samuel. In First Samuel chapter two, Hannah is praying a prayer of thanksgiving. The first ten verses, and Hannah makes the statement that he makes strong the strong, he makes stronger the strong, and he makes rich the richer, or richer the rich, and he makes the poor. He helps them. He helps the sick. He helps the afflicted. He helps those going through difficult times. And Hannah's right. That's God. You see, we can boldly come before the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter five, 4, verse 16, and know that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. We have that assurance. Yes, when we don't get what we want, we sometimes wonder if he cares. When I wanted ice cream and my parents wanted me to eat my vegetables, I wondered if they really liked me. And when we didn't go to the Dairy Queen, but we went maybe home, I wonder if they cared. And the reality is, yes, they did. They were looking out for my best interest. And they were trying to get a small dental bill as well. When I ask God, God, do you care? God says, yes. Gracious, I'm merciful, I'm compassionate. I love you. I love you. As we talked about last week, I love you. But I want you to know that I'm concerned about you. And so sometimes in the midst of our, our questioning God, does he care? God says, yes, I care. But second of all, the Bible tells us that God is great. In his loving kindness. You know, we hear about abuse in the world, don't we? We turn on the nightly news and, and, and we hear about those individuals that have abused their husbands or abused their wives or abused their children. And it makes our skin just literally crawl. We read the headlines in the news feeds and we see in those headlines where, where somebody beat or somebody killed or somebody did something terrible to somebody else. And, and, and it just turns our stomach to think that, that how in the world could we be so mistreating of one another in a society that's supposed to love and to care for one another. And sometimes we, we feel that with regards to God. God in his silence, we feel 
we feel a lack of love. But you see, the reality of it is, while this world may have folks that, that their actions make our skin crawl, not God. God is a, a loving God. God is a, a caring God. God is a God that we've already said is merciful and compassionate, gracious. God is a helpful God. You see, Paul, when he asked about his thorn in the flesh, he didn't get it removed, did he? But he was reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. He said, it's going to be all right. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to give you the things that you need, but you need to understand those are the things you need. But the thorn in the flesh, Paul, it's not going to be removed. My preacher, I have a problem with that. And my problem is that 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. The answer is that's true. But God in his comfort does not always give us what we want, but he gives us, as we'll see in just a few seconds, he gives us what is best. You see, God is willing to take care of us, and he takes care of the afflicted. Why? Because he loves us. Job questioned God's loving kindness. Now, you might say, well, I get that. I understand that. Job was a man that suffered a great deal. Job, in Job chapter 1, has everything going for him. I mean, he has everything. He has wife. He has children. He has riches. He has wealth. And he loves and, and fears God and stands for what's true and right. And then it all falls apart. He loses basically everything that's of wealth. He loses his family. He even loses his health. And Job, while he's assured throughout the rest of that book, while his friends say, Job, your reason that you're suffering is because you've sinned, Job says, no, it's not. And they don't sit there and have a tit for tat, if you will, like a nanny nanny boo boo sort of situation. One friend would speak and then Job would speak and then another friend would speak and then Job would speak and then another friend would speak and then Job would speak. And then Elihu, who was a, a young fellow, a young whippersnapper, he came in. He said, I got the answer. He didn't have the answer because if you really read his answer, his answer was was like Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. They were the it was the same answer. But Job, all he wanted to do was talk to God because you're still wondering about God. I'm wondering, really, does he care? And we know the, the end of the story. We know that Job is spoken to God. God comes to him in a whirlwind and he speaks to him. And he tells him basically this, this answer. Don't question God. Don't question God. Don't question who he is. Don't question the fact that he cares. Don't question that he's absent because he's not. For the creator or the created is not greater than the creator. And so he's reassured, Job is, of God's loving kindness. Then Job, of course, as you read the very last, if you will, little bit of Job, Job is blessed several times over by God, having more than, than what he had to begin. And you look and you say, well, well, why why did God do that? And the answer is, is that it's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Lamentations chapter 3, we, we like that, you know, verse 22, they are new every morning, great is the faithfulness. We like that last part, but read the first part. It's because of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. God is a loving God. God is, according to, and we can truly say amen when we open up our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter and the ninth verse. And we can find out that God is a faithful God, keeping covenant and promise with those that love him and obey his, God, his word. See, Moses reminds us there that it's God that keeps his word. It's God that is faithful 
to his word. It is God that is true. It is God who loves, but he loves those who love him. He watches and he cares. And so God is great in his loving kindness. Psalm 22, the psalmist reminds us there. that Yes, my, my couch may be full, may be wet with tears. Yeah, I know you love me. And a third point that could be found in Psalm 22 is that God in his silence, his answer may be far greater than what I've even asked. His answer may be greater. You see, we don't always get what we want. And, and sometimes we, we say, man, I, I came into that. I, I didn't get what I wanted. I prayed as a kid, probably wrongfully, but I prayed for a motorcycle. Why? Because every kid in the neighborhood had a motorcycle. And my dad talked to me about it as, as I grew up about the fact that he said it was always interesting to stand out in the yard and watch you boys go down to the, we had an old country store down below us. And he said, he said, and there'd go Tim and there'd go Mike and there'd go Jim Bob. And here you came on your bicycle. I didn't get it. The reason being because right before I was to get one, we went home one Friday night from a football game. We'd gone to watch Milan Bulldogs beat somebody else. And on the way home, we came upon an accident. A young boy riding a motorcycle had driven it up under a parked semi. And my mother said to them, who walked in the house, you will not get a motorcycle. And I didn't. And when I was riding that bicycle, chasing those other kids on their motorcycles, I wondered often why. But I can tell you one thing. I was in better shape than those boys. We went to play ball. Their, their tongues were dragging. I said, let's go. You see, when we don't get the answer we want, it's not necessarily because of us. Yes, we can ask, and we can ask upon our own lust, according to James chapter 4, and that creates problems. But sometimes God's going to give us more than what we would ask for. You remember the story of Solomon found in the book of 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles as well? It's interesting because in 1 Kings chapter 3, God comes to Solomon and he says, uh, he says, Solomon, he says, ask what you want. And Solomon, I think, really showing even his wisdom then, he asked God, he says, God, you've put me in a place, you've put me in a position to rule over your people. And so he says, give me wisdom and give me understanding that I may rule these people wisely. God answers Solomon's request. He says, you know, you've, you've asked wisely, but he said, he said, I want you to know something. What is that? Well, I want you to know that not only are you going to get wisdom and understanding, but I'm going to give you riches and I'm going to give you a long life. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, that's not fair. I only asked for a motorcycle. Solomon asked for wisdom, and yet he got more. See, he got what God wanted him to have and what God thought he needed. We, we read as well. If you read in the book of, of Acts, the, the 12th chapter, you see there that Peter, Peter is in jail. And the angel of the Lord comes to Peter and he says, Peter, he says, stand up quickly. I'm not sure why he had to stand up quickly. He's in chains, but nevertheless, he did. And the chains fell off. Now, you got to know something. Down the road, a little piece, there was the church. And the church was gathered together and it just simply says they were praying for Peter. And Peter 
walks out of prison. I know it's a great mystery. How did he walk through two, two, if you will, two desks, so to speak, two points of entry, two points in which he probably had to pass the guards? I don't know the answer in the text. doesn't tell me. It just says that he did. So I believe that he did. And he gets out and he goes and he knocks on the gate. Rhoda comes up and she answers the, the gate and she cannot believe what she sees. It's Peter. And she goes back in and she says, hey, everybody. She leaves him at the gate, by the way. She goes back in and she says, hey, hey, guess what? And they're probably thinking, she's interrupting our prayer. Peter's at the gate. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. He can't be. He's in prison. You're seeing things. No, that's not Peter. It is. And come to find out it was. They were just talking to the Lord about Peter, and the Lord delivered Peter. He got more, if you will, than what they asked. And sometimes God will answer our, our pleas far greater than what we've asked for. But yet at the same time, too, we've got to understand that sometimes in answering our prayers, maybe not the way we've asked them, but in answering our prayers, because God always answers our prayers, that it's to the benefit of others. I take you to the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew, the 26th chapter. Remember, this is where Jesus had taken Peter and John. And, you know, they had gone to sleep and he'd come. But he goes into the garden. Now, understand that the garden is really what we would probably liken into really a grove of trees. And he just goes in a little further into the, the trees. And he goes in there and he's praying. He's praying fervently. And here's, here's the request. Deliver me. Deliver me. Save me. Keep me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, the request is simple. Lord, I know that I've come here for this purpose. I know that you sent me to die on a cross for the, the sins of mankind. I understand that. I understand that I'm on a mission. I've, I've been with that mission all the time. But D-Day has come. Time has come. And Lord, this is where the physical part of the Lord takes over, I believe. And he says, Lord, you know, if there's another way, let's think about this. Because death by crucifixion was not pleasant. But then he added to his prayer, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I believe Jesus' prayer was fervent. I believe it was heartfelt. I believe it was meaningful, and I believe he, mean, he meant every word that he said. But God, in answer to his prayer, took the side of, Jesus, I answer this prayer not according to your will, but according to my will. And he let him die on a cross. He let him die hanging between two thieves. But because God let that happen, millions upon millions of individuals on the day of judgment will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's all because Jesus didn't get what he wanted when he prayed. But God gave for mankind a better answer. And so you see, sometimes when we pray, we don't get what we want, but we get greater. The psalmist in Psalm 22, as the ends of this psalm, is assured of that very point. But then he gives us also, he gives us also the reassurance that God will always do what is right. In this psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 22, the psalmist classifies two characteristics of God. First of all, that he's holy. Now, we think of holy as set up, set apart, separated. And while we read many times throughout the, the Old and New Testament, holy is the Lord. God is holy. Isaiah 6, we read holy is the Lord. Revelation 15, holy is the Lord. But holy is not just the idea of separate and set up on a pedestal. 
It's the idea of perfection. God is holy. He is perfect. And so when the psalmist in Psalm 22 clarifies and classifies God as holy, he's saying what he does is perfect. I may not see it that way. I may question it. I may not understand it. But I understand that it is true. And so God is perfect in all of his ways. But then the psalmist also says that God's not only perfect, but but he calls God righteous, righteous. God is a righteous God. Everything he does is not only perfect, it's right. The idea of righteous is the idea of right, right doing. What he does is right, and so what he does is perfect, and what he does is right. It may not be what I like. It may not be what I want. It may not be what I think. It may not be what I prefer, but it is what he thinks, what he wills, what he prefers. And so James reminds us to always say, if the Lord wills. You see, there were those in James 5 that were saying, we're going to go here, and we're going to go there, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And James says, if the Lord wills. But he who is holy and he who is right, that one will answer our prayers the right way. Do you think that Jesus took great pleasure, or excuse me, God took great pleasure when he answered Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with a no? Do you think that the father took great pleasure when Job was asking to see him and God was basically saying, wait a minute? Do you think that that the father took great pleasure when Paul was saying, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh, and here was this great faithful servant of his, and God says, no. Do you think the father's heart didn't hurt? Do you think that, that if you will, he, he didn't bleed a little bit within himself thinking, oh, you know, I, I, would, I, I would love to help them. I would love to assist them. I would love to do what I can for them. But right now, the best answer and the answer that they need is no. Or it's wait a while. Or it's you're going to get this and not that. That's a hard pill for us to swallow. But God in his silence The holy and right God will be sure that what he does give us is what is best for us. And so we praise God and we lift him up for what he does for us. Even in his silence, we are blessed. And so we are reminded in Genesis chapter 18, Sodom and Gomorrah are well known for their wickedness. And Abraham intervenes, talks to God. You say, God has decided I'm going to destroy Sodom, and I'm, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm tired of the wickedness. I'm tired of the evil. I, I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, no more. And so I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham steps up and he says, Lord, if we can find 50 righteous people, will you spare Sodom? And the answer is, Yeah. Well, how about for 45? Yeah. How about for 40? How about for 30? How about for 20? How about if we can find 10 righteous people? Will you? Yeah, I will. But do you remember what he said? In Genesis 18, when he says, Lord, he says, you're going to strike down these people. And he makes this statement. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what's right? In other words, Abraham's plea was, Lord, This is not the right thing to destroy Sodom. And so his statement, though, Lord, will you not do what's right? And the Lord didn't answer that, but he could have said, I will do what's right. When we go to God in prayer, when we talk to him, God will do what's right. And even in his silence, and we may not like it, we may even doubt him his existence, and his care for us. He's answering is what is best. 
what is best for all of us is to be his child, for him to watch over us and care for us. And so this morning, if you're not a New Testament child, God, if you need to put your Lord and Savior on in baptism for the remission of your sins, or you need to rededicate your life, the Lord bids you come while the other we stand and sing.